Hi everyone, thanks for clicking and welcome back to my channel. Today, we'll be talking about Genesis from a pilot perspective. I will only be covering the things we pilots need to know and won't go deep behind the engineering aspect of it as it that is not used for us. So without any further ado, let's dive right in. First of all, we're gonna talk about what is Genesis and its components, the principle of operation, errors of Genesis, and Genesis augmentation uh, methods and techniques. So first things first, what is a Genesis? Well, Genesis is a generic term to describe global navigation satellite system. There are more than just one Genesis. I'm sure you have heard the term GPS, Navstar. Well, GPS is owned and maintained by the US military, which means it's up to them where and when it is available and how accurate it is. There is also the GLONASS system, which is owned by the Russian government. The Europeans also have their, uh, their own Genesis system called Galileo. Uh, these are the main global satellite navigation uh, available for world, uh, worldwide navigation. However, there are also other systems such as the Chinese, they have uh, the Beidou. The Indians also have one of their own called the IRNSS. Uh, yet, these systems remain for local use only. They are um, geosatellites, uh, which means the space vessels, or the uh, satellites in this case, remain only over the territory of these two countries. To summarize, all of GPS, GLONASS, Galileo together form GNSS system, or Global Navigation System. So if you have ever been wondering what is the difference between GNSS and a GPS, well, it's like if you are saying what is the difference between a car and a BMW. A BMW is a car, so GPS is a Genesis. Galileo is a Genesis, and so forth. Let's now talk a bit about the GPS itself, which is the most commonly used. However, the principle of operations remain the same for all Genesis. GPS has a set of uh, satellites uh, called SVs, that are 24, roughly plus or minus, with spares, um, that orbit the Earth every 11 hours, 58 minutes, and 2 seconds. Well, that's pretty much accurate. Let's say once every uh, 12 hours. The constellation is such that at any given, given time, a minimum of 4 satellites are always available and visible at any point on Earth. Okay? So let's now see the components of GPS. Well, we have three components. We have the space segment, called the SV, space vessel, or simply we refer to them as satellites. And then we have the control segment, which is a ground station. It could be a master station, uplink station, backup station, that controls and adjusts the error and maintains the uh, uh, well-being of the satellite. And we have the third segment, which is the user segment, or simply the receiver. It could be a handheld GPS, it could be a car, phone, tracker, an airplane, a boat, whatever. Just a, a Genesis receiver. Okay, let's look at now the principle of operations, or the working principle. All Genesis work on the principle of uh, trilateration, where the SV, or the satellite, transmits two signals. L1 and the L2 on different frequencies because of ionospheric uh, layer. We will talk about the ionosphere later on the video. The signals are then received by the receiver. Embedded in these signals are a nav message that contains many data, such as the ephemeris, which is the satellite's exact position in orbit, also the accurate timestamp by the onboard atomic clock, almanac, the clock potential errors, as well as information about the ionosphere layer itself, along with all these messages, the exact time the signal has left the satellite. This is very important. When the signal is received, it must have taken a period of time, micro or nanoseconds. By calculating the time difference between the transmission and the reception, that duration of time is multiplied by the speed of light, which is the speed at which uh, radio waves transmit or propagate. The result is the range of the receiver from the satellite. 
This procedure is done simultaneously in, in almost no time by computers and it is repeated by a minimum of four satellites in order to obtain a 3D position, latitude, longitude and altitude. Now you may ask, three satellites might suffice, why do we need four satellites though? Well, that is a good question. As we know, the accurate, the, that duration between transmission and reception is the accurate our GPS position will become. Because even the slightest error of nanoseconds may produce dozens if not hundreds of kilometer uh, position error and offset. This is why satellites are equipped with atomic clocks, because they are extremely accurate and expensive to afford for that matter as well. Which is why it is not practical to have an atomic clock in our smartphones, cars, planes, etc. And here where the fourth satellite uh, comes in play. It overcomes this time offset between the receiver clock and the atomic clock. Okay? One more thing you need to know is the masking angle. So the space vessel, the SV, or the satellite, to be able to be included in the tri uh, trilateration uh, calculation, it has to be at least between 5 degrees or 10 degrees above the horizon, minimum. This is known as the masking angle. Okay, now let's have a look at the errors accompanied the GNSS. First error is the ionosphere. The ionosphere is a layer about 60 to 100 km above the surface of the Earth, where there are free-moving electrons. This layer affects and slows down the propagation of the SV signal. This is why the SVs transmit two signals on different frequencies. The second error is the clock error. SVs have atomic clocks, unlike the receivers. With regular clocks, which are uh, more prone to some offset, time offset is a difference in time between the SV clock and the receiver clock. Time error is corrected by the use of the fourth satellites, as we have previously mentioned. The general theory of relativity is the third error. A fast-moving clock, or any other object for that matter, will slow down. So SV atomic clocks, which are moving at around 14,000 km per hour, will slow down by 7 microseconds every day. And then we have general relativity theory. The slower you move through gravity, or the lower the gravitational field due to the distance from Earth's surface, the faster time passes. So at about 11,000 nautical miles per hour, the Earth or the SV experience a much lower gravitation force. Thus, the time on board ticks faster by about 45 microseconds a day. Therefore, we have 45 microseconds faster minus 7 microseconds slower, and we get a 38 microsecond time offset per day, which is roughly about 11 km position error. This time dilation is closely monitored and corrected by the control segment on the ground and then transmitted back to the SV via the uplink, uh, the uplink station. Now, we're going to have a look at GNSS augmentation. Although GNSS navigation is pretty much accurate enough, that is relied on almost completely by aviation and maritime, it is still not accurate to the degree that may allow us to fly precision approaches or fly in congested airspace. Thus, to further upgrade the accuracy and the integrity of the GNSS navigation, there are three techniques to do so. The first technique is the SBAS, or Satellite-Based Augmentation System. It is a differential technique that relies on geosatellites to pro uh, broadcast the augmentation messages to aircraft. With SBAS capability, we can now fly APV approaches, approaches with vertical guidance, such as the RMP uh, approaches, LPV, localized performance with vertical guidance, LNAV, VNAV, and so on. Types of SBAS we have in the uh, European, they have the IGNOS, system it is an SBAS. Uh, the United States they have the uh, WAS wide area augmentation system. In Japan they have MSAS 
Um, and in the end, I believe they have the Gagan. The next technique is the GPS, or ground-based augmentation system. Also a differential technique that provides augmentation to aircraft via VHF antenna within about 30 km radius, allowing aircraft to fly CAT-3 approaches. This system is called GLS, or GBES landing system. Its advantages over the ILS is that with only one antenna, it can serve multiple runways and even more than uh, one airfield if they happen to be in close proximity, which, which significantly reduces the cost of maintenance and operations of unlike the ILS. And last but not least, ABES. Unlike the previous two types, ABES focuses on the integrity only and not on improving solution accuracy. With ABES, airborne based augmentation system, two types of techniques are envisaged. RAIM, Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring, and AA, which is Aircraft Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. I'll be doing an extensive detailed video about RAIM soon, where I'll be covering uh, all its aspects and the principle of operations, so stay tuned. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is it. I hope this video has been helpful for you. As you may have noticed, I have tried to keep it as basic as possible because these are the basic stuff that we need, pilots need to know about the GNSS. If you have any questions or any query, please make sure uh, to leave them in the comment section below. I'll be more than happy to answer you guys. So until the next video, stay tuned and see ya.